A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I am glad you're with us on the program today. Uh, We're going to be talking about what's going on in the city of San Francisco. District Attorney Chesa Budin facing a recall election uh, over his soft on crime policies. And uh, Budin is uh, defending himself and his record uh, in the uh, pages of the New York Times with a, a big piece. San Francisco's DA says angry elites want him out of office. That's right. It's those angry elites, uh, and, 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 and you know the uh, the conservatives, right? The the conservative majority in San Francisco is uh, trying to get Chesa Budin out of office. There, yeah. Uh, specifically, we're going to focus in. Uh, we're not going to go through all of uh, uh, the back and forth uh, with uh, Chesa Budin and uh, the uh, New York Times writer uh, who uh, sat down for a uh, extensive interview with uh, the DA in San Francisco. Uh, David Marchese is uh, the uh, reporter for the New York Times. But specifically, there were a couple of moments uh, in this uh, Q&A where the issue of guns came up, either explicitly or implicitly. And I want to kind of go through this because I I think this explains, uh, not that Chesa Budin seems to uh, 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 understand this, but I think this does help to explain why even in a city like San Francisco, uh, Chesa Budin is uh, making more uh, enemies than friends these days. So Marchese starts with a question. He says, I know you talk a lot about wanting to address root causes of crime, but to what extent can a district attorney even do that? Isn't your ability to address root causes largely depend on other actors like the police, like the mayor that are part of the system? And again, this is what we hear from a lot of progressive prosecutors, right? Whether it's uh, Larry Krasner in Philadelphia or Budin in San Francisco or uh, George Gascon in uh, in Los Angeles. I mean, three of the probably higher profile uh, progressive DAs that have this mentality. But uh, I think even Alvin Bragg, the new DA in Manhattan, he sort of backed off of these policies. But you know, this approach of well, we got to deal with root causes. Um, it is a it's not just a talking point for a lot of these progressive prosecutors. It it really is, I think, a part of their fundamental ideology, and so. When Budin starts talking about what he can do to address, quote, unquote, root causes, I think gun owners need to pay attention because we are one of his biggest targets. He says, uh, so we know that gun violence is on the rise across the country with significant numbers in San Francisco. A traditional prosecutor might say that if someone is in possession of a gun illegally or uses a gun to do something unlawful, that we're going to punish them as harshly as the law allows, and that's our way of deterring crime. He says, the thing that frustrates me about that approach is that we're accepting that we don't have a role to play in promoting public safety until after a crime occurs. He then goes on to say, we're trying to be proactive in my office. In San Francisco, instead of waiting for the police to make an arrest in homicides involving a, quote, ghost gun and punishing the individual that committed the harm, we're suing the ghost gun companies and asking the courts to prohibit them from shipping their weapons into our community. He said another example is expanding partnerships with the state attorney general to get guns out of the hands of people who we know are prohibited from having them. These are proactive approaches to prevent gun violence, a crime prevented. There's no viral video of that. He says, but if we're serious about good policy, we must be proactive about preventing crime. Now, I would not disagree in the slightest that being proactive in terms of crime prevention is a good thing. I would, however, argue that the things that uh, Chesa Budin talks about don't actually prevent crime. For example, going after, quote unquote, ghost guns, right? This is the first thing he says, well, we can be proactive because we can go after these uh, manufacturers of uh, ghost guns and asking the courts to prohibit them from shipping their weapons into our community. Well, first of all, and if Chesa Budin is unaware of this, (laughs) he shouldn't be DA anyway. Criminals get a hold of their firearms through a variety of illicit means, right? Whether it's straw purchases, whether it's friends or family, whether it's making their own. And by the way, we're not just talking about, you know, 80% lowers. Again, anybody with access to a 3D printer uh, can now produce a firearm that'll get the job done for a, a random crime. There is no way to try to tackle violent crime by going after the inanimate objects 
as opposed to the individuals responsible for the crimes themselves. And this is where Budin completely misses the plot. He says, a traditional prosecutor might say, well, if someone's in possession of a gun illegally or uses a gun to do something unlawful, we're going to punish them as harshly as the law allows, and that's our way of deterring crime. He finds that frustrating, he says. He says, well, that means we're just accepting we don't have a role to play in promoting public safety until after a crime occurs. No, it's not. Now, again, if we're going to quibble about things, I would, I would actually argue that it shouldn't be a crime for somebody to carry a firearm without a license because you're exercising the right to bear arms. But when we're talking about the criminal misuse of a firearm, oh, that's something entirely. And you can be as proactive as you want, but once a crime has been committed, you have a duty as a law enforcement officer, whether it's a police officer on the street or a prosecutor, you have a duty to ensure that consequences occur, right? First, that an arrest is made, charges are leveled, the case is prosecuted, and justice is done. So yeah, there is a proactive role for police and prosecutors and public safety officials to play in terms of preventing crime. But you're not going to be able to prevent every crime. And so then the question becomes, how do you respond once a crime has been committed? And for Chesa Budin, it's, well, I mean, not only are we not going to go after people who are, uh, you know, carrying a gun without a license, which, frankly, I'm fine with. But Boone says, we're not going to throw the book at armed robbers. We're not going to throw the books at carjackers. We're not going to ensure the toughest penalties whenever possible for violent criminals. And that's too far, I would argue, for a lot of San Francisco residents, which is one of the reasons why Boone is now facing a recall. But Boone's hypocrisy was also on display later on in this interview when he was asked by David Marchese, um, OK, what about what's going on with drugs? in San Francisco, particularly in the Tenderloin neighborhood. And Boone's first response was to say, well, every city's got bad neighborhoods. I mean, look at look at, uh, look at the South Bronx, look at East Brooklyn. Marchese said, yeah, 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 yeah. He said, I wouldn't argue that other parts of the country don't have historically problematic areas, but my question was, are there anything should or could be done differently in the Tenderloin? And listen to Boone's response. He says, oh, absolutely. Tenderloin's an emergency. It's a priority. In San Francisco, we need to have safe consumption sites because people don't die of overdoses at safe consumption sites. The next thing we need to do, he says, uh, is, is people who are drug addicted to have an easier time accessing treatment and services than they do buying drugs on the street corner. We are prosecuting the people that police arrest, he says. It's not working because there's an insatiable demand for drugs for people who don't have housing, access to health care, access to employment, access to treatment, so they can help them reduce their dependence on dangerous drugs. So why isn't he going after the drug manufacturers? You know, like he's going after those ghost gun companies. Why, 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 why is there excuse after excuse after excuse me when it comes to the drug trade, the illegal drug trade? And yet, Chesa Budin doesn't, he seems to think that the legal firearms industry is something that uh, needs to be shut down while allowing drug addicts access to safe injection sites so that they don't overdose. And, and listen, I'll be honest with you, I'm not an expert on safe injection sites. I will note in Vancouver, British Columbia, where the first safe injection sites in North America were put in place, the drug overdose rate increased. It did not decrease after those safe injection sites opened. I would also argue that when you are um, fueling access for addicts to shoot up safely, you may be cutting down on the number of fatal overdoses, but you're not cutting down on all of the associated crime that comes with drug addiction. So now you still have these addicts who are, they need to find the money so they can buy their drugs. It's not like the drugs are provided at safe uh, injection sites, although they'll give progressives time, and I'm sure that that'll be the next uh, thing that they start touting. But you still got to find the money, right, to buy the drugs. You might have a place to shoot up under the watchful eye of a medical professional, but you still got to buy the drug. And that means that you're still going to have a lot of retail theft, a lot of shoplifting, property crime, things of that nature. And by the way, uh, violence is an inherent part of the illicit drug trade. So by allowing these open-air drug markets, you are continuing to fuel conflict among the drug dealers themselves. 
Another problem that Chesa Boone uh, seems to think can be addressed by going after gun manufacturers, be it, uh, you know, uh, companies like Smith & Wesson or, uh, you know, quote unquote, ghost gun companies like Polymer 80. Again, as long as you're not focusing on the actual criminal himself, Chesa Boone thinks that's the way to go, apparently. Uh, he even got more explicit about this. He tried to deny that he his approach was a soft on crime approach. He said, oh, listen, we're prosecuting, but we're, we're prosecuting those violent offenders. That's what he said. Sorry about that. Had a little glitch. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, he, he told Marchese, uh, like I said, he let the mask slip uh, later on in this interview, telling Marchese, quote, we have to recognize that the tough on crime approach has had lots of opportunities to reduce recidivism rates, and it hasn't worked. California went through a drastic expansion of incarceration during the 1990s and early 2000s. About two-thirds of the people being released from state prison after local prosecutors had thrown the book at them were rearrested within a couple of years. He says the other important thing to recognize is that when people talk about recidivism in San Francisco, if you look at the cohort of people that we've resentenced because we believe that they've served more than enough time, the recidivism rate is infinitesimally small, he says. But people who uh, people are going to focus on the Willie Horton case, the one case where something does go wrong and they're going to blame my office. I don't know why they blame Jessa Budin for Willie Horton, considering that was in Massachusetts back in the 1980s. But uh, this, again, it, it's it's a sign that Jessa Budin is actually, he's fundamentally unserious about addressing the real criticisms leveled against his office. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I, I, a, a, a more honest argument for Budin would have been, look, uh, yes, there are cases every day where we see offenders who have returned to the street go on to commit another crime. This is not endemic to San Francisco. This can happen and does happen anywhere and everywhere around the country. That actually would be honest because it isn't just a San Francisco problem. But to deny that it's a problem at all, <laughs> not just in San Francisco, but everywhere else, again, is to deny reality. So what are we left with with Chesa Budin, a guy who has a bigger problem with legal guns than illegal drugs, right? A guy who believes that uh, perpetrators of violent offenses shouldn't necessarily have the book thrown at them, but gun makers should be shut down, which of course would make it difficult and not impossible for law-abiding citizens to have a firearm to protect themselves against the violent criminals that Chesa Budin doesn't want to get tough with. Uh, and, of course, uh, it's completely different when it comes to drugs, right? In, in that case, again, it's it's not about going after the uh, the drug makers. It's not about going after the drug providers. It's not about going after the individuals who are fueling the cycle of addiction on these streets of San Francisco. No, it's about giving the addicts a place to shoot up safely. Here's an idea. What about providing San Francisco gun owners with a place to shoot safely? What would happen if Chesa Budin and Mayor London Breed and all of the other uber progressives in charge of San Francisco actually decided to recognize our right to keep and bear arms and started to foster a culture of lawful and responsible gun ownership instead of continuing to push it into the shadows like they do with, actually, I was going to say like they do with heroin uh, addiction, with intravenous drug use. But you know what? That's more open and acceptable in San Francisco than exercising your right to keep and bear arms, at least, again, among the political class, which I would argue is one of the big reasons why Chesa Budin is facing that recall election. Because even in a progressive city like San Francisco, there comes a point where people just say, enough's enough. All right, let's turn our attention to today's Armed Citizen story, our uh, good deed of the day, and our recidivism report, which does not come from San Francisco. It actually comes from the Lone Star State of Texas, Tarrant County, Texas where uh, WFAA reports that uh, three suspects from Tarrant County who are out on probation or bond uh, accused of committing more serious crimes uh, in the very same week. They say in the last week alone, three violent accused criminals in the Fort Worth area were out on bond days before they allegedly committed new offenses. The first case that they talk about, a uh, gentleman... Uh, 26-year-old Nathan Woodard was accused of stabbing his mother to death. WFAA reports, according to Tarrant County Jail Records, Woodard got out of jail just nine days before he allegedly murdered his mom after serving a year behind bars. Uh, police also say a man who was out on bond for an alleged domestic violence incident earlier this year is now facing more charges after 
His 26-year-old victim was found dead, buried under a home in Fort Worth. A guy named uh, Valerian Austin, age of 24, accused in the death of 26-year-old Melissa, uh, Marissa Grimes, a mother of two, had been reported missing in Arlington, Texas, on February the 12th. According to court documents, Austin has a history of domestic violence. An arrest affidavit says in January, Grimes told police that Austin had held her at gunpoint and threatened to kill her. Um, former district judge says that the judge may not have known that when allowing Austin to post bond on his latest charge. And then uh, last Friday, there was another case involving a suspect who was out on bond. An 11 year old baby kidnapped, allegedly by her father, a guy named Lancelot Dawkins, who has a violent history. He had actually bonded out the morning of the alleged abduction and drove straight to the home of his uh, child's mother, his ex-girlfriend. Their police say he strangled that woman to the point of unconsciousness before taking the infant. Dawkins and the baby were found in New Mexico. The baby was unharmed. Dawkins was arrested. And so, again, you know, these are not cases of, uh, you know, uh, where, 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 where trials have uh, taken place or plea bargains have been accepted, cases have been adjudicated, slap on the wrist. No, these are people, though, who are accused of very serious offenses, who were returned to the streets in a matter of hours, a matter of days, in one case after serving a, a year-long jail sentence for a, a previous crime, uh, who almost immediately went on to commit other offenses. Now, again, this is not a problem that is endemic to uh, San Francisco or Baltimore or New York or progressive areas. This happens everywhere because 97% of felony cases in this country result in plea bargains. And we uh, have a tendency, look, under the Constitution, it's, you know, you have a right to a speedy trial. You cannot simply be held in jail or in prison for years on end uh, while the legal process slowly grinds away, right? One of the issues that we have to deal with when we're talking about, uh, you know, no bond and putting people out on bond is we've got to, we've got to ensure that there are speedy trials. Because this is the solution right now to a court system that is clogged and plagued with delays, is, well, we can't keep people behind bars forever while they're awaiting trial, so we'll just return them to the streets. And when they are accused of committing more crimes, when they're awaiting trial for their previous charges, they're often just given bond again and put back out on the streets. A real effort to address this solution does not just involve getting rid of cash bond it actually involves uh, reducing the number of plea bargains that are offered, increasing the number of judges and prosecutors, and again, and public defenders, uh, to ensure that we actually have a functioning court system instead of one that is run on, uh, held together, I should say, by a string and spit and a, a hope and a prayer and a uh, again an offer of a plea bargain. Uh, finally today, our uh, good deed of the day, and and our armed citizen stories. See, I didn't forget. No, one of the same, actually, from the Commonwealth of Virginia. A man is accused of trying to run over a good Samaritan, one of whom fired back in self-defense. This was in uh, Woodbridge, Virginia, uh, one of the uh, D.C. suburbs there. Happened Saturday night at a uh, commuter parking lot in Woodbridge. Started out as a domestic dispute, allegedly between that gentleman that you see there, uh, Enoch Espinal Estrada, and a 27-year-old woman. Estrada's 42, woman's uh, uh, 27. The pair were in a vehicle, and they were stopped there in this uh, commuter lot when uh, Espinal Estrada allegedly assaulted and choked the woman to prevent her from exiting that vehicle. Now, the woman was eventually able to get out of the car with their five-year-old daughter. They ran to another vehicle just trying to get some help, 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 right? Um, the people in that car got out, hearing the woman in distress. At that point, Espinal Estrada is back in the car. He's behind the wheel. He's driving around the parking lot trying to find the woman. He sees her, sees the other group of Good Samaritans, and he starts driving towards them like he's going to hit them. Uh, one of those Good Samaritans, a 57-year-old man, drew his legally carried firearm and fired multiple shots at uh, Espinal Estrada's car, hitting it once. Espinal Estrada then hit that Good Samaritan's car, which had three kids inside, by the way, an 8-year-old, a 5-year-old, and a 15-month-old. car sustained significant damage. Espinal Estrada's car then hit the woman and a 16-year-old Good Samaritan as he fled out of that commuter lot and onto I-95. 
Woman was taken to a local hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. The uh, 15-year-old boy treated at the scene. No other injuries reported, thankfully. Uh, officers did manage to uh, track down Espinal Estrada at his home. He has now been charged with aggravated malicious wounding, malicious wounding, two counts of attempted malicious wounding, three counts of felony hit and run, abduction, strangulation, and domestic assault and battery being held <clears throat> without bond. It can be done, apparently. The uh, armed citizen slash Good Samaritan who came to the aid of the uh, woman and her child, not facing any charges because uh, they were acting in defense of another. And thankfully, they were there and willing to act in the right place at the right time and willing and able to do the right thing because Lord knows what the results of this situation might have been had those Good Samaritans and had that armed citizen not been present and uh, ready to step in to protect the life of a stranger. That is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program. As always, we will be back tomorrow with more of the latest Second Amendment news and information that you need to know about. But you don't have to wait until then. You can go to BearingArms.com anytime you'd like, and you're going to get updated news that you should know about your right to keep and bear arms, how it's being impacted for the better and, unfortunately, for the worse in some cases. If you like what you see, you can also become a VIP subscriber. All you got to do, go to BarryandArms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS. We'll give you a significant savings on your VIP membership, uh, which will also give you access to exclusive analysis, news stories, commentary you won't find anywhere else. It's our way of saying thank you for showing your support for the independent pro second amendment journalism that we're producing at Barry and Arms. Until we talk again, be well, be safe, and be free.